I, uh, I don't think I've had one client in about two weeks. So you're my first client in two weeks. I swear to God, it's just the July is always the, um, slowest season for me. It's so slow. I mean, yeah. I, it's kind of like December, December and July. Just everybody's kind of busy probably with vacations. Oh yeah. It is. So all those Patreon followers are getting gypped at the moment, but you know, there's going to be seasons where I host in three sessions a day type of crap and no one can keep up with them. So, yeah. but my writing, I'll tell you, I have written, I swear so much in the past two weeks, so much. So I'm just, I'm kind of like, this is probably meant to be, you know, yeah, that's awesome. so. that is very cool. Right. Yeah. yeah, so we did. I went on vacation. And, and um, how have you been? Where are you at? Where are things going on? I mean, yeah, cause... well, you know, I, um, I feel like I'm in a much better place. I realized, I watched a video on the Patreon account where somebody had kind of talked about their, like, the whole issue with carrots and weight. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that that was something I never really explored was kind of the, um, my mom and, and wanting her approval. And then it's like you bury these feelings so deep inside mm -hmm. because you love your mother so much. So you don't want to like look at the feelings that you feel kind of mm -hmm. from whatever issues. So that was something that I kind of wanted to explore a little bit more because I don't think I fully understood it. But um, I know, like, my mom with her interest in the weight loss, but I don't understand exactly how and why. Because even my sisters, we always do the same thing. It's like when my mom's around, we always eat healthy. Oh, we only eat well. Out of, like, stevia and stuff. But then <laughs> so we she... all know that when she's not around, we're going to eat, like, cake. <laughs> <laughs> so she must be highly critical of food and fearful of food and controlling of food for you guys to feel Extremely. well. And there's so, so, so there's that truth and reality of your mother's, your mother's state of mind with food and her issues with safety around food. So if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we would say her first hierarchy of needs is not secure unless it's highly controlled. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you grew up in that way, did your mom always talk about, well, that's bad for you. That's bad for you. You know, kind of like religious doctrine, you know, it's, that's. Yeah, definitely yeah. demonizes, you know, sugar, fruit, GMOs, um, you know, all toxins, basically mm -hmm. everything in the world is deadly. Okay. So <laughs> something to, uh, something to think about is, of course, that's programming, right? Because there's an entire industry that thrives financially on that concept. But there's also the innate humanness that is wired to be concerned about the safety of the food that we eat because evolution has. So there's two parts to that. So her fear of food isn't bad. We shouldn't demonize it. The other aspect that is maybe magnifying her response to having the fear of food is the fact that it, that she doesn't trust the human body. The body can't handle it. So there's always the two sides, right? It's I, the body can't handle this and that is bad, right? Like this is a bad situation I'm living in and I can't handle it. Those two together magnify your emotional fear. Yeah. And it's so, almost like a, um, a fear that you're, like, killing yourself. So you're like, wow, I'm yeah. eating GMOs. Okay, but, I'm yeah, just the body. I'm myself so bad that I'm going to just eat this terrible food. Well, the it's assumption like, kind of is the, the body can't handle The body can't handle it. So, so keep that yeah. in mind. To believe that, to have that belief, you have to also believe the body cannot handle it. So, and then you add to that, I am afraid to die. And what is death? Mm -hmm. Um... You know, one of the things that I became radically aware of in my personal recovery and my out of body experience was that the body is its own entity with thousands of mechanisms going on at one given moment that we're completely unconsciously aware of. And not only that, but it's what it 
took for the body to function the way it does was millennia of evolution. And, and the, all of those processes occurring with dynamically changing environments and lack of food and too much food and toxins that are not just in the air, but on your skin and the body's ability to adapt is why we're still here today. You know, why, why the human species still exists because of the body's ability to adapt to kind of radical changes in environment, whether it's heat, lack of sun, lack of nutrients, um, you know, all of these mechanisms and our awareness and consciousness isn't necessarily meant and, and equipped even to, to actually manage all of that. Can you imagine if that is our role in life was to try to psych, you know, that intellect, our intellect is inferior. Right. It's not capable. It's, it's like the ant trying to understand the universe. Like it's not <laughs> Well, yes, and it's like our brains can hold one thought at one time. We're aware of one thing with some peripheral stuff, and the body is capable of, in so many ways, beyond our even awareness, managing thousands of pieces of information at one time. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it gave me, um, it was like, it made me laugh at how funny what I was doing. It, it was so funny that I was thinking that I could actually control my metabolism. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious, right? Was, yeah, and it's interesting because I had kind of, I was after I I'm trying to prep this at all, so I'm eating my foods, knowing, you know, I'm like, there's chemicals in here that are going to, you know, make me die or whatever. It's like, I am a speck of dust in this whole universe and my life is a blip anyway and I'm here experiencing this state of consciousness for however long it lasts and there's probably never going to be another time. So who really cares if the body, I mean, to a certain degree, not that you want to go make yourself crazy about it, but you can, I can't see how it can be forgivable, the state of conscious or whatever is going on. Totally. Well, the, in the society, in the scheme mm -hmm. of things. Well, um, the, the thing, the thing about it is, is it's definitely egotistical to make the assumption we can control things. That's, and not only that, but it comes with suffering. Yeah. Because you really don't know what you're controlling. It would take, you would have to have the grand plan concept of what, the body is and how it functions to even come to the idea that you can control things. Right. And think about that in order for me to think I can control, I would have to be aware of everything that needed to be controlled. So the idea that I think I control things is very narcissistic and egotistical, or you're just so you're so naive to actually what is the magnitude of what you think you're capable of maintaining. Yeah. And anyway, so, so the idea that the food is bad is requires that you also hold a concept. The body can't handle it. There's two parts. So when I went into the body is beyond capable of whatever GMOs you're eating, it's, it, it is capable. Um, it, it, exactly. It's and it's, not, you know, I mean, it's handling however it's going to handle it. In, in fact, when you add, compare, just compare GMOs impact on the body and what your fear of GMOs impact the body is, which one do you think is more tedious? Well, I think the fear is probably going to, cause your body worse health over long. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, well, we can make that assumption, right? It's like, well, cause your response is if this are threat. So the whole body goes into kind of fight or flight re reaction, which is way more intense than whatever unconscious GMO you're eating. We can yeah. assume. Right. So I heard, um, like Carol and this one said to like, she talked about like why, like just people's different consciousness and she, sees people in their dying moments, so many people. He's like, I don't care if you eat cat food, if you're an honest, authentic person. She's like, you will be healthier yes. than the person who's holding on all this crap, eating the most organic 
Okay. Oh yeah. Well, well, yeah, because the body's response to the food changes depending on your beliefs about it. That's science right there. That's not my opinion. Yeah. And that's something they've studied for over a century, you know, with Pavlov's dogs and, um, and the other guy that I've been studying that studied fight or flight response to food, your beliefs about the food changes. It's the body's response to digest the food in not only that, but the palatability of the food, you know, how we perceive things changes the body's response. So there is the reality of our environment. And then there's the reality of our beliefs that creates the response, right? You have to have a belief that yeah. then creates the response. So the perceived there has to be a belief for you to perceive it a specific way, yeah. right? So the belief often is this is bad one and I cannot handle it. So I can't handle it. And this is bad. There's a pair of both of those, right? Yeah. In whatever order, you know, it's either I, I, um, this is bad because I was told. And if I do it, there's another bad reaction to it. Like, for example, this is bad because I hear it's bad. Therefore, and then your brain naturally built in is sensitive to that fear mongering because of our evolution around safe food. And then there is, I'm a bad person when I do it. There's, I am a bad person. So what that means too, if you add to this around your response to it is if I do this, I am, this is a reflection of my worth and value as a human being. And when it comes to your mother, I wouldn't be surprised in it, if, even if you don't believe that, like if I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on white bread, I'm a bad person. You might think that's dumb, but she thinks it's true. So you're still trying to get her approval. Even if you don't believe in it, you're still holding yourself. Well, and some of that is understandable, right? Again, let's not judge your response to wanting to be loved by your mother. This is like, for me, um, leaving the religion I was raised in, I didn't go around talking about the things that were so horrible for it, how it impacted me psychologically and spiritually in such a catastrophic way. I didn't need to do that, right? I just was silent around it and let them think what they did. And, and, I didn't necessarily go out of my way to drink coffee because that wasn't something we were allowed to do. Right. You know, makes sense. Um, that's different though, than being really fake around your mom or lying mm -hmm. in a way. Did you ever feel around your mother? You were lying. Like this is, I'm living a lie. I'm being, a, I'm acting a certain way to, yeah, like, well, um, or is it to protect her right from, yeah, it's almost like a, um, yeah, I don't know, it's funny. <laughs> well, let me, let me see, give it two, let me give it two different directions. And there could be more to it. This is where you have to really contemplate it. Is it about saving face so that you're perceived a certain way so that your mother thinks you're doing the right thing and, oh, I'm proud of her and whatever. Or is it, I'm just going to protect my mom from being upset at me. So I'll comply. Yeah, I think it's probably the first one. Well, it would resonate with you. It would resonate. Like, uh, for example, when I would go home, it's, I love really good wine. Um, I'm, I'm not going to drink wine, not because I want my mom's approval, but because it's going to make her really uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah, I don't need to. My mom never drinks, so we never, so yeah, I, I both. <laughs> right. I remember the first time I had um, coffee in front of my mother. I know that sounds so dumb because it is super dumb, but because um, that's the truth. It is so dumb, but uh, you know what? She ultimately something to, and there is a gray zone around what you do and what you don't do to, to honor your father and mother, right? There is a level of honor. Um, where if I continue to comply to their little tiny box, I'm enabling them to not actually love me to actually know what true love is. Um, uh, again, this good takes me back to the moment in my out of body experience where I witnessed my mother's grief from the, from my suicide. I, I, um, I've told you all about this, right? Have you heard all? Yeah. Okay. So I witnessed her grief. And in that grief, I realized she had lost complete touch with reality. Um, because she, 
I could feel the difference between the grief and the love that I felt after I had died and the, the love that I felt through a filter without her awareness. So the love I felt was only through religion. It was always religious based. It was never about me. It was always about the religion I had to comply to. Then I, then there was love, right? And spirituality. And I could feel that they were the same, that that was love, but it, she had lost complete touch with the vulnerability of the real depth of the love that she had for me. That was unconditional. And so, um, in, in becoming aware of that, I realized that it, I don't need her to change. Like I don't need her to, uh, not judge me if I leave the church because I'm aware, I became aware that she had lost touch with reality and she wasn't, she didn't have a clue how much she loved me. She was just so fixated on this religious doctrine. But ultimately I could see that that religious doctrine and how radical and intense she was about it was love. It was like putting that huge unconditional love into a tiny filtered string yeah. of love. Anyway, so I, I, I was at that point, I was like, Oh, I, I love her. And I, and when she does judge me, I'm so forgiving it. <laughs> She's clueless. Yeah. She's clueless. She has no idea how much she loves me. She just, you know, and so, um, there was this, uh, just, oh, okay. it's like seeing her as a child, like, Oh, she doesn't even know it would take me committing suicide for her to become aware. Yeah. That her, her viewpoint is so sheltered and small and tiny, but that's all she has to work with. You would take again, yeah. death for her to become aware and I don't need her to do that. So if it means that I, I experience her criticism, it really is because she loves me and that's her safety zone. Yeah. And so your mother, so, okay, here was my so point. If my if point. I give up, basically like to her, it's like, um, I have a lot of sense that, like, sense of, like, you're a loser. Yes. Like, because my way is superior. Correct. And, like, and you're oh, flawed. You know, and you're doing it wrong. You're wrong. You're doing it flawed. Right. So and, I am wrong. And you're dumb. <laughs> and there's a better way. And you're doing it the wrong way. Yes. Right. What that is, is the truth for her that what makes her feel safe. Yeah. That Those limits and those restrictions and those everything are judged bad because they're dangerous. Can you see how loving that is that she would want you to stay inside her tiny little anorexic way of living thinking it's also righteous. Yeah. So superior not realizing that it's really quite sad in terms of her limited, uh, not only that, but how much her life is devoted to that shit. Right. She's held hostage. And I think too, like, somebody explains her, like, let's just, let's just say that this would almost be cruel to like, or to explain the ego and the concept of ego, and then be like, you have all this freedom to do whatever, but they've only known their tiny box. So I almost feel like some people would just, they'd rather stay in the box because that's all they knew anyways. Well, so yeah. even if they knew something else, I don't I mean, you know. Well, she saying, feels like, safe well, where she's she at. Herself if she wasn't. Uh, obsessed with food. That's like her life is correct. Like, well, it would take a, like a whole like identity crisis for her to break yeah, out of that. Yeah. Just, yeah. And <laughs> can you see how that would be kind of a uh, cruel to expect almost, yeah, to, for her to for leave her that to space? Leave that. Yeah. Well, and if that's where, what she truly feels from the inside is the right thing to do. Don't you agree that she has the, she should be given the free will to, to stay in that space. Yeah. So. Okay. So my point, the point I was wanting to make to you. Yeah, it's her deal. It's her. Correct. That's what she's thinking. Correct. Right. And she thinks that it's really important because it gives her a sense of, um, probably gives her a sense of specialness and ego mm -hmm. and identity. Like this is what 
my life is here about. And you know what? It's not your job to tell her she's wrong. She'll figure that out on her. She'll figure out the limitations of what she's doing. It's not right or wrong. It is what needs to be done for her to figure something out. We can sit here and judge it all. But in the end, it's like judging my eating disorder and how intensely horrible it was. Who's to say it was bad? When ultimately it, it brought me to a place of total and complete surrender, which is now what I'm sharing with the world. You know, so there is a purpose and intention that only, you know, God and reality and the universe understands and it's complicated. So if she needs to be in that safe place, would you want her to be there? Right, I would. I know, and you would just, and so you wouldn't judge it. You, but the key for you is yeah. to recognize that, and this was the point I was trying to make earlier. I, in, in relation to my mother, I realized that by, by constantly complying to those limitations, I was truly enabling my mother to not really know what true love is. It was because I stayed inside her safety zone. By being real to some degree, it was actually giving her the opportunity to know what true love is, which is unconditional. So it's not like I lied to her and stayed inside that religion. I married out of the religion and I, you know, wasn't going to baptize my children and whatnot. I just didn't, I wasn't a victim and I wasn't angry and I didn't have to tell my mom she was wrong and how horrible that was for me. Right. I, but in, in what, in a, in effect, what it did is it just was a peaceful way for me to love her, care about her, go to church with her when I was with her, but also give her the opportunity to see that I am thriving. I am free. I'm that child that had gone missing, right? Cause she could tell that something was horribly wrong before and to see that, you know, and I didn't have to do it as an argument of I'm right, you're wrong. It was just, I am going to just be. And if this opens her up to really love me without being inside the box, then great for her. But it also gave me a sense of autonomy that I needed. So again, there were certain things that I didn't do around her. I tried not to cuss. Um, I, I, you know, I respected her limitations. Right. Yeah. And that reminds me, like, even when I went to visit my dad, of course, we all went to church, and he was so proud and happy to have his family in yeah. church with him. Good. I'm so, I'm so happy you gave that to him. That was a gift for him. It was yeah. a gift. Yeah. So, and then the other thing, because I have been, um... Well, one that I noticed was as I'm doing more exercise, I noticed that I had created mental blocks around the idea that I had to be a certain weight or something with that that was somehow a prerequisite. And so as I'm doing more rollerblading and sort of uh, expanding that, no, it's that's actually not true. I'm fine at the weight I'm at. I'm still moving. <laughs> I love it. So you kind of observe the old programming. You could hear it was there and the thoughts were there, but by ignoring it, you allowed yourself the freedom of that enjoyment of the exercise. Yeah. That's a big deal. So you can kind of see past the bullshit. Again, yeah, that was programming. To kind of like hear the programming and be like, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Get it. Do you see the cruelty of it? The limitations of it? Like only thin people can do this? Only people yeah. who are fit before they can get fit? You know, that's super common, right. by the way. I can't go get, can't go be physically active until I lose weight. <laughs> yeah. What? Right. Well, that's. And the other thing that I thought was interesting that I was listening to, well, there's two things that David Hawkins was talking about. One was the whole glamour of everything. Which is almost like the opposite of you have to be a rug so that you can be like this most luxurious, idolized sort of thing. I thought that was kind of interesting. And one of the ways that came out was we're actually planning a trip to Greece, out of all places. And of course, my my I'm list, I'm hearing my thoughts come. And of course, it would be so much more glamorous if I lost weight. Oh, you know, yeah. Like a experience. <laughs> well, the funny thing is Make that 
right, make it all about the body that you're in, not about grief, oh not about the fun and the relationship yeah. with your husband. It's about the way you look, you know, just, yeah. again, that is the glamour. Yeah, I do that, but I do see how we're kind of put around to, um, want to glamorize everything. It's almost seems, I don't know, I just thought that was... Well, it's in the, you're living in a fantasy, so you're just, you're fantasizing about a concept of what you want rather than actually accepting what it actually is. And so when you come out of kind of that lower consciousness, you can see that it is all a lie to glamorize every, anything. You're setting, you, you're aware you're, that sets you up for really disappointment with reality. Reality is reality. And do you want to suffer for some concept of the way you look? Or do you want to actually experience what you're experiencing in the present of the experience open-mindedly without fantasy? Yeah, with the truth of what it is. Just what is it actually going to be like? And if you can remove the fantasy, that, but the, here's the thing. It's impossible to remove the fantasy if you're not content with where you're at right now. And I think maybe that's where you're kind of getting challenged is, can I be, can I accept reality now? And what does that take? If you don't know what that takes, you may want to accept that. But if you're not accepting that, you're not currently accepting it, you don't necessarily have an experience of it yet, which means you're not going to. Um, again, this is another yeah, thing that I learned in my out of body experience. Well, I noticed, well, definitely as soon as we decided to get married, I started thinking about like, what kind of That's awesome. Oh my God. So you're not being um, controlled by these thoughts there. You're now aware of the thoughts and you're absorbing them for, Oh my God, that's huge. That means the space is opening up for you to breathe in it. And it's not so, um, impu the impulsivity is gone. Holy shit. That's a big deal. Yeah. Cause before, so before you would have not, you wouldn't have question those thoughts and you would have impulsively gone on a diet without questioning it. And then you would have been like sucked into the drama. And then you would have wondered why things are going haywire again. You wouldn't have re even recognized the process. It would have just been boom, happened. Who, uh, the same as getting married or you go on a trip, you know, to wherever you go on a diet. It's like, Oh, well that's, no, that's the thin like supremacy. That's what thin oh, supremacists oh, do. Right. That's, yeah, that is not what people do. That's what thin supremacists do. You need to recognize that that is. I feel like I see that so Yeah. Yeah. It's like the norm, it seems like. Well, it is yeah. for, it, it has been for you because you've been in that cult. Yeah. You've been, you've been. So it's, it's like, isn't that what everybody does? Well, everybody in that cult does that. You just assume, yeah. and that's what we should do because that's the morality behind it, right? Because it, your experience will be brighter and be more beautiful and more blissful, and you're closer to higher consciousness when you're thinner, which means you're free, you have freedom to do everything. When in, yeah. And that's just, a, a again, a fantasy because the people who yeah. think that way and who live that way are more concerned and honed in all their brain is focused in on managing food and managing their desires to eat. They don't really get the freedom at all. They're hijacked right. and chained. Actually experience, experience. You, can't do both. you can't No, you And so you have like these blinders so on that don't give you the freedom. Would be right, like yeah. Up oh yeah. And then the shame. And then you're either, and then you begin, and, and then if you feel like you failed, you, you're wrapped up in the binging aspect. You don't really get any freedom. It's just an illusion right. of freedom. You're kind of in a jail cell. Either you're isolating yourself from food and, and, and worshiping yourself in the pride of your thin achievements, glamorizing yourself. Yeah. And you're constantly comparing yourself to other people in the room because you have to be the most, you know, that's the narcissism right. of it all. But yeah, I mean, you don't really get the freedom. It would take humility to actually just experience grief. Just experience grief. Total humility, because right. it's not about you. You don't want it to be about you. It'd be like, do you really want to have the spotlight on you in Greece? Right. <laughs> that's 
Do you see what I mean by in order for you to just exist, you'd have to be okay being blacked out. That's what it feels like. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and it's not, it, it actually, I know it sounds so counterintuitive, but it's not, it's like, I don't want anything to be about me. Nothing at all. It's not about me. You know, it's about experience. Yeah. That is, um, yeah, so, um. Well, that's exciting. This has been a, that's a good test. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. Because that, it's like, um, I always say when it comes to recovery, you have to be willing to, you know, be blind to the body, even if your son's getting married and you're the mother of the, your, you know, mother of, of the groom, you're getting family pictures taken, you're getting wedding pictures taken, you're, you're going on a vacation, you're going on a cruise, you're going to be in the beach in a bathing suit. You have to be so unattached from the way you look and other people's perception of it to include your husband's and anybody else around you for you to be able to say, to not care, to actually go, I'd rather care about the experience. I'd rather be in the presence of the lovingness versus the looks of it. Yeah. Right. The experience of like, uh, where you're going to be the different land, the different culture, the different moon, the, the moon and the sun cycle, the different, you know, foods and history, like that has to be really important versus I'm important. Yeah. Right. So the question you have to go into is why am I so important? What is it that I'm lacking to where I'm seeking freedom through the me concept? Where does me, the idea of me, what's that going to do in the long run? Well, it certainly eliminates everything else, right? Because you got to focus on yourself. It's really about yeah. self-preservation down there, right? That's it's meant to be that way. You're not doing anything wrong by thinking I need to preserve myself by losing weight before I go on vacation. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because I was reading something kind of uh, just like um, how the heart sort of builds walls around it and it gets hurt. So okay, that's somebody... not true. That's the mind. <laughs> The heart does not do that. The mind does okay. that. That's all mind. True. That's all ego. The ego builds walls around it as it it's because it's a victim. <laughs> That's what you just okay. said. Poor me. I'm a victim. I've been hurt and I can't handle it and I can't handle it ever again. So I'm going to isolate myself and then create a story around who I am around all that. So the, no, the heart doesn't do that. The mind okay. and the ego does that. Yeah, starting even as a child, right? Yes, yeah, you got so, it. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I was wondering. I was like, well, how does the heart feel, Daddy? I can see how the, you know, maybe it. The heart does not do that. Or something. That would be the mind and the ego gets hurt. Yeah, okay. the concept of what my life should be versus reality. The moment you reject it, now you're a victim, and yeah, now the heart funny. is hurt. But yeah, don't confuse. Do not confuse okay. the heart from the mind. The heart is all accepting, it's unconditional. It's like the trees. It's like your, it, the heart is the essence of God, if you want to say that. So how is the essence of God hurt? Yeah. So when you surrender, so let's say something hurt your feelings or it feels like it hurts your feelings. Yeah. Your, so yeah. Okay. Then you, so then you have to like figure out, well, what is, feeling hurt or whatever it's probably some egoic concept or something so well yeah it's um, always about right and wrong or something right yeah. there's a concept of duality there to where i there is something said that i that um, actually what it is is something was said or done that points out my own fallibility and i don't want that to be exposed mm -hmm. So the surrender is just accepting like, fallibility and not and believing and not seeing that there's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's like when you look at humility or let's say you made mistakes, like we really just think about it all. It's like, so what? <laughs> well, it's not even so what. It's like, well, I didn't make a mistake. I made a decision based on the best of my capacity at the time and what I'm aware of. And what's the mistake in yeah. that? 
Of course, after the fact, I can see that there are consequences I was completely unaware of and naive. And I would, and I have some, I, if I knew better, I would have done better. But this is, the, yeah. this is the reality of grace. And, yeah, well, it's funny because, and I don't know, it's probably, um, one of the things that I was studying David Hawkins' work a little bit, and he talks about the spiritual ego. Oh, yeah. There's a whole realm of another no, yeah. mm-hmm. whole system that Alice is going to fall down to. Into, into, oh, yeah. Into, he goes into, into yeah great detail in the eye of the eye. His second book goes into great detail oh. around spirituality. Do I have that in here? Okay. No, I, I gave it to order to read the books in because I was like, okay. So, but, yeah, I definitely want to look at that one because I had been following, like, various, like, multi-dimensional people and all. And then when I understood the glamour of even, like, other dimensional realms, and now you can just get trapped in that forever. Uh-huh. Oh, and yeah, like, the astral stuff. <laughs> well, it's because of our animal brain. You can't get rid of that That's animal brain. Yeah. yeah, and so you become, you just, ha- it, the, the work to uh, stay conscious just requires that you're constantly surrendering the mind of the ego at all times. It's like a, um, a riding weight loss apocalypse. As I wrote it, I had to surrender any attachment to it that I had potentially glamorized or fantasized about. I wrote it as if it would not make any money and no one would like it. Right. That way I could be truly authentic and speak from the awareness I had at the time. I'm still doing it today with this current book. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like perpetually constantly surrendering the, what, the ego wants to gain from it so that in yeah. the end you're writing it not for gain, but for, for me, it's for letting go of information that I don't necessarily want to keep on talking about. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to do this my whole life. I'd like to move on. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's true too. all right. So you're keeping it pretty tight to the truth of, the essence of where you're at, right? So again, it's like, um, yeah, even if you're, let's just say you're being worshiped, you have followers, you have to see, first of all, you have to remain to a certain level of conscious to see that it's all an illusion. Anyways, nothing is really yours. You can't claim shit. And, and not only that, but like, for example, what I'm aware of isn't my awareness. It's awareness that I just so happen to be capable of sensing at the moment. And it can go away like this. The yeah, moment I attach to it. Interesting. Like you had mentioned something in one of the videos, but it, it, what it kind of reminded me of was like um, a lot of people in like the new age sort of community are like, we're becoming like God or whatever, which kind of still reminds me of the old serpent in the garden. You'll become like God or whatever. And it's like, but you're just experiencing, like, you're just, like, you didn't invent integrity. You didn't invent this thing or whatever mm-hmm. just because you experience it. So it's still that claiming it, of it. Even yeah. if you're multidimensional and you think you're just, you know, amazeballs. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is, again, it's like, that's, that's, that's the um, nature of the animal brain, you know, wanting to feel special. But even then, that's like saying that we're not like God currently, mm-hmm. right? That's like saying that the way we are is flawed. Well, is the way we are in every step of our evolution, isn't that all God? So are you saying God's flawed right now, but you eventually you're going to get to a space where you're not flawed like God? That is no different than you're going to hell or you're going to heaven. Yeah. The idea is that you're currently not okay. You're currently, as you are, you are in inadequate. And you go from like one state of not being adequate to another state (laughs) of your entire life. Still inadequate. Exactly. And constantly trying to prove that you're, I'm adequate and repressing all the inadequacy that is actually still there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what I, so what I, what I try to, 
teach or something that, you know, that uh, really has helped me continuously in my own recovery from, from all of that brainwashing is I'm, first of all, accepting that I'm okay being perceived as inadequate. Absolutely. From so many angles, I'm inadequate, right? I'm inadequate to religion. I failed that. <laughs> I'm going to hell, inadequate to that God, right? That God concept. I'm absolutely not good enough and will never be. And I'm not forgivable. I'm an apostate, you know, to that religion. So the other thing is that I, there's a relative inadequacy that I am always okay with. That takes humility to be okay with. I'm being perceived as inferior and I'm okay with that. Okay. There's that. There's also the reality that if, if the truth is, if, I, if everything I'm doing at this current moment is in relation to what I'm currently aware of, you can give me a concept, but if I am not currently aware of it from within, it's irrelevant information. This is why I do not read self-help books. The only person I read is Dr. Hawkins and he's not a self, that, those aren't self-help books. <laughs> they're not, <laughs> they're discussions, they're science, there's thoughts, you know, um, well, what is self-esteem? What is oh, self-esteem? Okay. You know, is it, yeah. how does one, how do you define self-esteem? Right? So that's an important yeah. question. Yeah. What does that mean to you? To me, that's like saying I am good enough. That's it. And, and it's truthful. Like that I am whatever it is that I am, which is really not my doing anyways. It's the way I was created and I'm just experiencing it, you know, without, yeah. I just, it's like spontaneously experiencing whatever that is. I am, uh, yeah. that's gotta be good enough. Even if it is perceived as inferior and what if you are inferior? What if you just suck as a human being relative? <laughs> you know what? If that is what it is, it's good enough. <laughs> It's, it, it's gotta be good enough. Right. So that's to me, that is self-esteem. That is what that is. I am good enough e with all my flaws, with every relative flaw that is existing. <laughs> it's good enough. You know, if I'm in the, if, uh, you know what, when I was at the lowest point of my life at the lowest point of my con experience and the lowest consciousness right before committing suicide, that was good enough. Because that's where it was. Right. Good enough. That was the truth. There was yeah. nothing I could have done for my own awareness to get out of it. It took a freaking out of body experience. Yeah. You know that I didn't create. Yeah. And who's not to say that this wasn't meant to be what we learned in this lifetime or whatever? You know, so that. So why do I got to sit there? Yeah. Or whatever, anyway. You got it. And, and, and to, for it to claim it all, right. It's like, it's like the Buddhist yeah. non-attachment, but yeah, spiritual ego is everywhere. Yeah. It, it occurs in the diet industry. It's so spiritual to be a vegan. It's so spiritual to be sugar free. It's so spiritual. You know, we can take it and contort anything into what we want to feel special with, whether it's, I'm aging appropriately. I'm fit. I'm the concept of healthy. What do you think that is? That is spiritual ego, right? The concept of purity of the body. Like I'm claiming the health of the body. That's like claiming millennia of evolution and everything that it took for the body to maintain homeostasis under any given concept to claim that I'm healthy. That's like claiming I'm spiritual. Just think about it. Claim that, Everybody is. but no, but th just be open yourself up to that thought right now. Just open up a space and ask, what does it take to claim spirituality? You would have to, well, in order to actually claim spirituality, you have to be the creator of it. Right. Just the truth. That's the truth. You would have to create, you'd have to be the creator of faith. The creator of kindness, the creator of givingness, the creator of grace, the create you have to create all that. Yeah. We do have free will. Okay. We do have our free will, which is really a variety of a lot of things coming into play. Past life, karma, whatever you want to call it. Right. And then there is, but, but to think that I 
you know, this was something that I've come to really understand more so understanding um, and studying Dr. Hawkins work because he's so good at teaching this stuff. But even to say I am the kindness that I felt as a child, is that who I, it, it, should I claim that kindness as mine? Because I didn't create it. It just occurred spontaneously. I just, ex I just felt lovingness, funness. So can I claim I'm fun? Or is it really just my, the humanness that I am experiencing that is fun? Mm -hmm. Can I actually claim it as mine? Well, then I'd have to be the person that created fun. Right. And, and we do have free will to, to, to actually promote those emotions. It's promote where you were promoting. Yeah, we can choose to promote those feelings, but I don't create them. That's du it's, yeah, that's duality. There's no fear of death just because the body wants life. And there's not, it's just spontaneously arising in and of itself. <laughs> so I didn't understand that. I think a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the I don't want to die, which is the duality sort of. Of I am. Like an opposite or something. Yes, but, that would be like, okay, that's a great example of like the state of being your mom's in. She's afraid to die, so she thinks she has to create survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, that's the yeah. that is inherent to our human this the survival of the species, and it has come to serve our species over decades or thousands of years. And there comes a point at which we're kind of like, can we can you transcend those states that we're wired to be in under certain environments, right? Mm -hmm. That are promoted under certain circumstances. And some of those circumstances are not just environmental. They're how you perceive things, right? Your perception of, can I handle this? You know, the other thing about death, which I think is really fascinating is how we perceive death is that we, our concept of self will die. I will not exist. Well, what I are you talking about? What I are you afraid of dying? Is it the, you know, this is where the, the use of the eye of the eye and the, his book eye comes down to the, the, the truth of reality, which is God or the universe, the massiveness of infinite creativity, or it's the concept of yourself, the lowercase I, right? Yeah. Anyway, so that, yeah. so if, it, so the thing about the the fear of death in most people, it's the fear of losing their identity, their concept of self that they've created. Yeah. It's it is the death of the ego, the well, death of the concept. It is, it is funny when you do begin to question things like, uh, for example, I like doing my nails. I don't know. So now as I question that, I'm like, well. I see I'm programmed to like nails. <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> is it hard? But yeah. then so what? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do I personally mm -hmm. like it and want to keep it? Or do I want to check it because it really wasn't interesting anyway? Because at the end of the day, if that's what I was thinking about, it's like, okay, in all the universe at this particular time, I have the opportunity, let's say, to eat a Twinkie or not eat a Twinkie. And so what if I experience eating a Twinkie? Because I'm probably not ever going to experience <laughs> Twinkie. <laughs> like, oh, I love it. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. You, well, you got it. And that's the thing. You got to be, first of all, just come to re realize that there are certain things you, you're not aware of. And you know what? At the point you become aware of, it's relevant. So until that point, you keep on doing what you're doing. And you know what? And if you're doing your nails is just enjoying the body. If it's a part of an expression of uh, beauty for you in your mind, of course you can say my toenails are done. I got my toenails done. That's absolutely yeah. conforming to society. That's absolutely some form of, of a female uh, concept. 
I'm all, I don't care. Right. <laughs> either way, either way, I just don't care. Yeah, so I have my toenails painted. In fact, they I put I had them put in gel so they last all summer and they look so terrible. It's like I have a reverse French manicure right now or a French pedicure. <laughs> they look so bad. I don't care. The the, the it once you once you start actually caring, now there's something you might need to learn to become aware of. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, so it's like yourself. yeah, the goal is that you can mm-hmm. live in reality and that you can stay unattached while living in it. You know, um, it's like you don't have to, in order to meditate, you don't have to isolate yourself from the world. You don't have to go it. You, you can meditate in, on a park bench. You can meditate, you know, you can do it. There's so, you can, uh, you don't have to completely disconnect. Sometimes people do to figure to learn. Yeah. You don't, the goal is that you don't stay on a mountain to, to feel spiritual. That's a vacuum. That's like a, you know, you're creating a conditional environment. So it's only experienced under those conditions. It doesn't mean that it's actually a practicing condi- um, in, uh, condition, right? The goal is that you can stay unattached while attaching. It means that whatever you, yeah, whatever you gain, you're constantly, but it's not like, oh, or yeah, it's not, I'm not attaching to it as me. It, it's just uh, assimilating into the culture and, and really enjoying the fun that it is to express it. It's like um, I live in this current time and, you know, and where the way we express activity is through weightlifting and swimming and doing all these things. So, so that's how you express it. You know, in a hundred years from now, they'll be expressing their physical activity in some other way, right? Whether it's yoga, whether it's Pilates, it's like you can express your physical experience. (laughs) You know, there's, it's just like, yeah, just be, just exist in the current reality and, but just don't attach yourself to it to where it's like who you are as the self, as a concept of yourself. Right. Yes. So if you deta- if you're completely unattached to getting your nails done, curling your hair, then it doesn't matter if you can't do your nails or you can't do your hair. It doesn't necessarily affect you so much if you get cancer and your hair falls off. You won't be so devastated or traumatized or uh, isolated from the world because you have no hair. Make sense? Whereas someone who's attaching to that condition, they would have a Lit the uh, cell brain neurological response to loss and devastation, right? So, and then it's interesting when bad things come up, it's the opportunity to surrender it, basically. Yep. So, as things come up, you got it, and you just live that way. So, you live that way. They. Only way I can say it's like, well, how have I been able to to do the to do what I've been able to do for the course of twenty years? Well, any time anything has come up, just say in relation to the eating disorder, at all times I'm surrendering thinness and accepting fat. And anything the body is going to do, whether I'm in pregnant, whether I'm going to go through menopause, whether I got to take steroids, whether I'm, you know what, if I, the the physicality of the body's weight and body fat and leanness and fatness I surrender at all times because I just don't I don't want to care so I don't so the lack of the lack of care around it is what gives me all this freedom so the way to to lack caring around it is to actually accept all vulnerability from high to low and that includes the willingness to not care even if I'm thin and getting uh, benefits from it. Meaning people think I'm smarter. People think I'm more successful. People think I'm more credible because of it. It's fucking hilarious. All the anorexics listening know they've contacted me because they think I'm thin and can do it. (laughs) Right? She had the secret. She does. (laughs) You know, and it's like I reject. I I would rather be fat and not get that. Right. So it's like being blind. That's why I use that, that, um, to help people get a sense of what it feels like. It's like being blind, even though I have my sight, 
and literally blind to my body and what you think about it and what either you judge about it or what you give to me for it. I'm blind to it. And I don't okay, mix. Yeah. It's like you can paint your nails, but be blind to whatever. Do you really care what someone thinks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That's that. That's a non-attachment. Well, if they're just, if they, I'm losing you. Yeah, because you might be evolving and they're, uh, beyond what their evol evolution is. So you have to give what they're not aware of. You have to give them grace of that non-awareness. Yeah. And it's not like you're criticizing them. It's just, and, and plus you have to, even if you explain it, if they still have those beliefs patterns, it doesn't matter. They're still going to think that you should do those things to be attractive because they've been conditioned by those concepts. It's kind of like foot binding. And, and I, I use that as an example. You can absolutely believe it's not just the women that wanted the women to foot bind. The men did too. And they believed that the women with the smaller feet were more valuable. It's, they symbolized it as right. something that was so superior that both men and women wanted women to bind their feet. Right. <laughs> you know, even if they thought it's terrible that these women can't walk anymore, it's terrible that they can't, that they have all this pain and anguish and they're, I might love that person, but there's something or something going on in my mind that makes me believe that she should continue to wrap her feet and we'll have all of our daughters do the same thing, even though they're aware that this is okay. terrible consequences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The power of that aspect of the survival mechanisms. It's millennia. You can, yeah. that, it's that third hierarchy of need, what it means to assimilate to a tribe and the tribal dress codes. Right. You know, and, and then to see from an ego perspective, like, well, I have been conditioned and maybe I do think it's fun, but I don't attach to it. But maybe other people still attach to it. No, and that's. But you're saying about like the anorexic. Correct. You got it. Yeah. They wouldn't have called me if I had more weight on me for sure. Right. Type of thing. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Fun. Right. And the same occurs on the other side. Someone's not going to call me because they don't think I know what it feels like to be a binge eater. It goes both ways. Yeah. And I don't care. It's not my, it's not my. Right. You can't. It's yeah. Fun. Yeah. It's, it's well, it's none of my business. They should do what they feel right. If that is a constraint, that means that that's part of their limitations, which that's why they're going to suffer, which means at some point they're going to suffer more, blah, blah, blah. They need yeah. to find what's right for them in the moment. So, yeah, you just get to where you're like, I'm living in the world, not of it. I'm wearing, I'm wearing the clothes. I'm not going to wear it so tight that I'm suffocating. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 concept of adapting i mean and that's the other thing that i remember becoming very clearly aware of it the reality of our environment that we live in we have to take into account our humanness and recognize that our humanness ultimately is wired to want to blend in i'm wired to want to blend in nothing i can do about it you know and so blend in don't criticize the fact that you're painting your nails or that i put makeup on or yeah but, but you know, but realize that it's just scenery. It's just scenery. It's not who I am. It is just the, it's who the human is. It's the humanness. Yeah, it's a temporary experience yeah. of the body. 
body in this particular Yeah, and our species. We are that's part of the species. Why do we gotta criticize that? Part of the species. Mm -hmm. You know, um the that we're we're the we're the birds with the feathers that wanna dance around and you know it you know Yeah. <laughs> Fun Okay. That's yeah, yeah. Oh, cat oh yeah, and it's funny. It's really cute. It's really funny. It's like why take it so goddamn serious? Have fun, right. enjoy, and lit and enjoy the life you're living. Like just be in it as it is, truthfully, right now. And if that means you need to go on a diet, go on a freaking diet. But you need to know you're gonna suffer too, and you're not really gonna get anywhere. But you will get in your head somewhere. It's in your head. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's for give it all. Give it all space. Yeah. You know, the more, and I think that's what I'm hearing, which is really good. You really are kind of giving yourself the space. That's how you're you're aware of all this. Like I said earlier, yeah. you're not getting been, impulsively sucked into it. Yeah, I've definitely been reading a lot of the things with Hawkins and um, beginning to kind of understand that the part of the ego that wants to, like, milk everything to death and, and then being aware of, like, watching my, like, observing that part and all of the things it says. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. Awesome. Yes. Awesome, Melanie. You're kicking ass.